All right, welcome to part seven of my series looking at Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. I think that's three times in a row I got it right. Now, these first three definitions are all religious in nature. You can't scientifically show any of these having taken place. But the fourth definition, microevolution, is a scientific fact. In fact, you could show millions of examples of microevolution. That's interesting. Uh, this whole point, you know, you guys recognize is from a Kent Hovind um, seminar. Uh, the whole thing about the different definitions of evolution and only one is scientific. Uh, it's there's a whole bunch of flaws with it. I'm not going to get into all of them. They've been it's been addressed by people much smarter than myself. Um, but you 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 really think that that things like uh, the origin of the cosmos or the, the origin of, of organic chemicals is something that we just trust on faith. There's absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever that, that, that the scientists that research work are professionals for decades in those fields. Um, what are they, are they just like locking their lab doors and then like, I don't know, playing Tetris or something like that and not really doing any research and just pretending they are. Um, you, it's kind of a really ridiculous concept if you think about it. Uh, every one of those scientific disciplines, you you are working in that field, you're producing papers, you're getting grants, you're doing research in that field. If you're not ever, in all of these years, producing any evidence for it, uh, the discipline would cease to exist. And since there are, I know that there are cosmologists... I know that there are molecular biologists. I know that there are organic chemists, ones that specifically work with abiogenesis. I know that there are scientists that look at the major differences between classes and phyla of organisms. Um, those scientists, and, and looking at the origins of each of those, um, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and guess that there is a, just a little bit of evidence for, for those disciplines. So if someone were to say to me, Russ, do you believe in evolution? I would say, well, certainly micro. And again, and we'll get to this later on, um, the, there's no real difference between micro and macro evolution at all. There, there, there simply isn't. You're, that's, that's a creationist fallacy. Um, the terms are used, were formally used in a scientific sense, um, but not in the way that you guys use them. The reality is macro evolution is just lots and lots of micro evolution added up. And again, Russ is going to hit on one of the major points of this later on. So, Russ, how would you rate your, your education, your background in the sciences? Certainly micro. So, Russ, how important is integrity to you as a human being? Certainly micro. How important are facts in your presentations? Certainly micro. What are the odds of you getting something right in this presentation? Certainly micro. Nah, I'm just having a little fun. We could go down to the pound and get a pair of dogs. Mutts would work the best because they have the widest gene pool. And we could breed those dogs together for a thousand years. And we could take traits among the puppies and breed those puppies together. And we could end up with hundreds of different types of dogs after a thousand years. But after a thousand years, how many non-dogs would we have? So it's interesting that you bring up dogs. That, that's a, it's a great subject. Um, it's a great way to introduce um, a topic that I think needs to be said. Um, this might take a little while. I apologize. Um, so about um, this is this is a viewpoint I believe, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. But I think it's correct. Uh, this is the view of evolution, of adaptation, microevolution, and such um, that I've heard Russ express many times, and also many uh, lots of other creationists in, in in viewpoint. And I think it's a it's a it's it's important to understand what they mean or what they what they think is occurring. Um, before we can begin to counter it, all right, if that makes sense. Um, so this view, using, okay, he, he used the analogy of you could take a couple of mutts from the pets from a store or whatever, or a pound, breed them together, and in a thousand years you could have hundreds of new breeds of dogs, right, um, from those. But nothing that wouldn't be a dog, no non-dogs. Now that, that's the point he's making kind of tongue-in-cheek, I guess. Um, but... What the viewpoint now? This is something that that I've seen in a couple of his things. Okay, um, he's looking at adaptation. He's looking at his view of adaptation of microevolution is that there's this gene pool available, this God created gene pool in of kind, right? 
from that gene pool, we are, as, as an artificial selection, selecting out a certain characteristic, deleting the, not, the other characters we don't want, and ending up with only the type of dog that we want, and that's in the case of dogs. Uh, not tr that's, that doesn't seem, it seems like sort of self-evident or may maybe non-self-evident, I don't know. Um, but what I'm trying to get at with that is that, so in, in the model that Russ Miller is discussing, since wolves are the ancestors of all domestic dogs, in fact, the dog is now really a subspecies of wolf, um, since wolves are the ancestors, that means that if you were to take a blood sample from a wolf, sequence its DNA, you would find in the whole giant genome of the wolf, all of the components, all of the traits that we see in every single modern living dog. So if you took a poodle, you would find the hair type, the hair color, the body size, the behaviors, all of that, the genes that code for that in a poodle would all be in the wolf genome, even if they're not expressed. So what, what somebody did is they took a wolf and they bred out all of the characters that are non-poodle, carved away, you know, like the old, the old carver's thing about carving away what's not what you want. Carving away everything that's not a poodle, and that's how we get the poodle, if that makes sense. It wasn't, I'm, I, that's oversimplification, but I hope you get the point. Um, the problem with this view is that it's wrong. Um, there's simply not, the wolf genome is not some super giant dog genome that contains all this information. Um, mutations occur, mutations in hairstyle. Um, no wolf has curly hair. The, the, no wolf has the alleles to produce curly hair, okay? What produces curly hair? There's a mutation in, in the hair follicle that happens in all mammals that can produce a rare mutation producing curly hair. Once that's produced, it can be selected for, um, and then every single descendant after that's going to have the curly hair. It, it, has the, it carries a curly hair allele. It's going to be curly haired. It's new information. It's a, it's a new addition to the genome that wasn't there before. Same thing with genes for being larger than a wolf or genes that for being smaller, alleles for being, so I'm sorry, i got to be careful not to mess up because he misuses genes and alleles here as well. But alleles for size, alleles for hair color, alleles for hair the silky versus thick or wiry or curly or straight, long, short, all of those characteristics that differ from a wolf are because there some people were breeding wolves, domesticating wolves. Suddenly they get one that has a, a different hair color or they have one that has a different, a useful characteristic that, or they want, maybe they just like it. Maybe it's useful, whatever. And they say, well, this one's puppies. We're going to keep these, this one's puppies. And then that trait is, is, is eventually becomes fixed. The allele can become fixed in the population. It's an allele that did not exist before. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I, I, to understand Russ's position on this, where and and why he's so very very wrong. Uh, and the other thing is, is I think that he's really really not quite understanding that a dog giving birth to a non-dog, a dog mutating and giving birth to something another kind of mammal that we have never seen before, wouldn't be proving Darwinian evolution. It would actually be. We would have to rewrite everything we know about how evolution occurs, how natural selection works, um, everything. It, we, we, it would simply be a major, major change in our understanding of evolution. It wouldn't prove evolution. It would actually, um, I don't know if it would disprove evolution, but it would certainly cause us to rewrite all, all of what we know about the mechanisms of it. Now you laugh about that. Why? Well, because that's a silly thought. Dogs won't produce non-dogs. They're not going to produce parrots or pine trees or pumpkins or anything else, right? <laughs> Absolutely. See, that would be a, an example of Darwinian macroevolution. Jesus haploid Christ on a bike. It wouldn't be an example of macroevolution. It wouldn't be an example of evolution. It would be an example of something not predicted by, not expected, never seen, whatever in evolutionary biology. And today, as of today, no one's ever found a viable example of Darwinian macroevolution to show anybody. Oh, there are a lot of frauds in the textbooks. We're going to start getting into those here in a couple of minutes. All right, your frauds in the textbook. I can't wait to get to that. 
But Darwinism is scientifically impossible. You could breed roses. You could get red, white, yellow, pink roses. Some do better in the desert. Some do better up in the mountains where it's cold. But roses will only produce roses. So, gingerballs, you bring up roses. I'm so glad you did. Um, let's take a look at a few roses. So what is a rose? I'm sure that most will agree that this is a rose. And this is a rose. As is this. But what is it that makes a rose a rose? Fun botanical answer to that. Well, roses all belong to the family Rosaceae, also called the rose family. But what defines that? Probably the single most important thing that defines a member of the rose family, and remember, by most creationist definitions of kind, members of a family are also members of a kind, is the presence of a flower structure called the hypanthium. Unlike most other families of flowering plants, the roses have the sepals, petals, and stamens fused at their bases into a cup-like structure. This is called the hypanthium. Here's a close-up of a member of the rose family called an avens, genus geum, that shows the hypanthium. For comparison, here's a similar appearing flower of a buttercup, genus ranunculus, that shows, albeit poorly, the sepals, petals, and stamens attached independently to the calyx. So, this is a rose. Look at the flower close up. See the hypanthium? But take a look at the fruit. Look familiar? And this, this flower, not surprisingly, is also a rose. Look at the hypanthium. But when fruiting, you may know it as a rose by another name. Yes, the blackberry. It is surprising to many that the rose family contains so many familiar species that are not thought of as roses until you look more closely at the flowers. Peaches, plums, pears, almonds, I could go on. Here in Alaska, we have a good number of rosacea species, including silverleafs, potentillas, ashes, elderberries, burnets, and, of course, roses proper. Let me give you three facts to remember and if you will understand and remember these three facts, I will show you how you can destroy Darwinism in seven seconds flat. And you could debate any professor or scientist anywhere in the world from Oxford to Stanford to your local community college and win hands down. This should be fun. I have a sneaking suspicion that these three facts are actually good for debating, good for crushing the arguments of imaginary professors, ones you never actually meet in real life, ones you never actually have to talk to, but ones you can make up stories about while sitting on an airplane. Fact number one with regard to microadaptations. They always produce the same kind of plant or animal. There's a scientific principle known as the DNA code barrier. Exactly as I thought, your first fact to defeat Darwinism is a fact that's completely made up. There's no such scientific principle as a DNA code barrier. It doesn't exist. Fact number two. Microadaptations result, think about this, from the sorting or the loss of their starting genetic information, from the parent's starting genetic information. This is another scientific principle known as gene depletion. Gene depletion? Uh... I think, you ref I think you're referring to allele, allelic depletion, not gene depletion. You should really learn what the words mean before you use them. Um, again, I recognize that your audience is scientifically illiterate, so it doesn't matter if that you use the completely wrong words. Increasing new and beneficial genetic information in the existing gene pool is a major problem for Darwinism. As of today, scientists know of no way for nature to add appreciable amounts of new and beneficial genetic information to an existing gene pool. All right, busted. No way to add significant amounts of useful information to a gene pool, except for all of the fucking ways we know of in which nature can add significant amounts of important, useful information to a gene pool. Things like polyploidy, things like gene duplication. Um, and that's not just copying existing information. It copies existing information. And then the copies can mutate. This has happened. Ever hear of corn? Corn is an example of polyploidy leading to a completely new kind. They should have millions of examples. I can show millions of examples of kinds bringing forth after their kind. Why can't they show millions of examples? How about just 100 examples? How about one viable example? They can't do it. Darwinism is a fairy tale. 
I can show you thousands of examples of ERV insertions and chromosome fusions that indicate all life on this planet having a common ancestry. Can you show me a single example of a species being created out of thin air? Something poofing into existence from nothing? Can you? Creationism is a fairy tale.